Hello everyone, this is Criminal Profiler Pat Brown and welcome, welcome all my patrons who are here for the live part of the show and if you aren't a patron, patron and you want to be part of the live in the chat room just go below and click on Patreon and you can see the different levels when you can join and, uh, and join us here. So anyway, hello everyone. Thank you for being a little patient. The internet went down again. I, we have new internet. Uh, we have a new router coming. Supposed to be 10 times the speed. <laughs> we'll see. Oh, thank you, Lisa, for saying you can see and hear me. Because the internet has gone down like three times in the last couple hours, and it's been very frustrating. So we have a guy coming out on Tuesday. Let's hope this solves the problem because it's getting pretty old now and I'm getting very frustrated. So at any rate, but I'm glad you're here. Oh, hold on. I'm already hot because I've been running up and down stairways trying to get this thing to work. All right. Before I start on this, these two very bizarre cases of, whoops, I'm wrong, the wrong way, Alyssa Lamb and Phoebe Hansjuk, um, two women who died in very strange circumstances. Um, one in California in the USA and one in Melbourne in Australia. So this is our, our uh, Asia and Oceania show. So it's Friday night, nine o'clock in the US, but it's lovely afternoon, I believe in Australia. So we have hopefully some people from Australia here. So anyway, hello Florence and Lisa and Molly and Carrie and who else is here? There, there's Benny, who's crazy. He's in Denmark. He's up at like three in the morning. I don't know what's wrong with you, but I love you. Um, K-Rab, uh, Christine is here. Hi, Christine. And Anne is here. And I know Anne is very interested in this case because I've seen your comments, Anne. And I will be commenting on your comments. And did I miss anybody? <laughs> Not sure if I missed anybody. Let's see, Benny, Benny, Benny. Let's see who else is here. May is here. And she's coming in from Hong Kong. Woo! Yay, May. All right. So, if I missed anybody, sorry about that. Now, uh, just before I get started, um, let me just do the needful here, um, which is, since I am highly demonetized, I do appreciate all of your help. Uh, first of all, just even subscribing to the channel. You know, you find out about all the different uh, videos. Uh, you can go to my playlist and see what's there. You support the channel. Just like, subscribe, hit the bell for notifications. And if you want to get more involved in the community, because I'm developing a community here, uh, do go to Patreon and join. Supports the channel and lots of things to do. And buy a book. Okay, that's it. All right, now let's get on to this, this case because, cases, because we've got two of them here. And we're going to start with uh, Alyssa, Alyssa, Alyssa Lamb. We'll start with her. Okay, so hold on a second. Let me just get my comments back up here in case any of you have something to say here as I go along. And I'm trying to see what you have to say. So let me tell you who this poor young woman was. Uh, this all occurred in February of 2013. People are still questioning it. Um, Although this one, people are not as confused about as the other case of Phoebe Hansjuk. So, but still, still a weird case. All right, so the, on February 19th of 2013, the body of Chinese-Canadian tourist Elisa Lam was recovered from a large cistern atop the Stay On Main Hotel. <laughs> By the way, now it says stay on main hotel. That's because she really was at the Hotel Cecil. And this got such a gruesome history of like serial killers staying there and all kinds of horrible things happening. And this happened. So they changed the name to stay on main, not the evil Cecil, you know. So, and that's in downtown Los Angeles. And she'd been a guest since uh, January, of t January 26. So she went to stay there for a while. It's kind of a, how, what do you want to say? Crappy place. A relatively cheap place to stay when you haven't got a lot going for you uh, and so it's got a lot of characters there let's put it that way she did get a room with somebody else but the other somebody else has asked that she be removed from their room because they're like there's something wrong with this girl so the hotel actually put her in a private room because there were so many complaints so she was having issues let's put it that way uh, she was last seen alive on January 31st and reported missing by her parents on February 1st. Okay, so exactly what did happen to her? All right. So what happened was her body was then found, discovered by a hotel maintenance worker. Because people were complaining that there was flooding and there was like low water pressure. And the water tasted really funny. And they found her body up in one, this cistern on the roof. And 
that could be why the the water didn't taste so good. So that's kind of horrifying and disgusting. But you know, that's what happened. So they found her, but they couldn't figure out how the heck she ended up in the, in the cistern up on the roof because that's pretty weird. <laughs> you know, that's not usually where you end up when you go missing. So. <laughs> <laughs> I still don't want to stay there. Maybe not. I think it, it might have just some, some kind of bad luck place, you know what I mean? So I can't blame you on that one. All right, so so let's see what happened. Um, it's interesting. The parents filed a lawsuit against the hotel, which you know, really, you know, there was, was, it was. Oh, my clothes are falling off today. Hold on a second. <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, they filed a lawsuit they lost. It's just like the hotel didn't do anything to this girl. So at any rate, so what happened was she had been blogging and she had been talking about her struggle with mental illness. In a January 2012 blog post, she lamented that a relapse had happened at the start of the current school term, forced her to drop the classes. She felt utterly directionless and lost. She t titled her poster, Always Haunted by the Idea You've Wasted Your Life. And I mean, this is a young girl, so why she thinks she's wasted her life and she's this young is, is frightening. So anyway, she kept blogging that she was having all kinds of issues. So she was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and depression. She was prescribed Welbutrin, Welbutrin Lamictal, Seroquel, and Effexor. So they, they gave her a lot of stuff. Supposedly, she had no history of suicidal ideations, Okay. But she had a history of not taking her medicines mm -hmm. and therefore would suffer hallucinations. And that's very, very important because, you know, the problem, people don't understand how severe hallucinations can be. Hallucinations put you in a different reality. You're not seeing what's in front of you. You're seeing something else. And let me explain how that works. So <laughs> um, I was working as a sign language interpreter. Many people know this. I used to be a medical sign language interpreter. And I had a particular client who was in the psych ward. And one time I was sitting there, she was next to me, and, and, and the doctor was sitting there, and she starts signing madly. And the doctor says, uh, what is she saying? And I said, well, she's saying some rather interesting things. And he said, to me? And I said, no, to that person over there. And, of course, the doctor looked over, and there is no person over there. But she was having a, a wink humdinger of a conversation with whomever she saw over there. And many times when I worked with her, she looked past me. You know, instead of looking at me, she's looking past me. And I knew she was seeing people around me. And uh, sometimes getting very angry, getting very upset, and even becoming violent uh, about what was happening in a very quiet, peaceful room with me just saying, hey, what's up? You know, how are you, how are you doing? You know, you know, what's wrong? And, and she's like, and looking somewhere else, talking to people who she saw, but no one else did. So when you're hallucinating, um, it's, a, it's, it's like being in a dream world. And you know, when you dream at night, you think you're there. Just imagine that happens during the day. You think you're there. You, you have a dream world superimposed on what's in front of you. So you're seeing all kinds of things that just simply are not there. It could be stationary furniture. It could be it could be a landscape. It could be human beings. But you're seeing something that is not real. But you think it is. So anyway, um, so according to Amy Price, the manager of Cecil Hotel, after they moved her to her own room, um, she was leaving notes for her roommate um, saying things like, go home, go away. And she'd lock the door to the room and require a password for entry. <laughs> So, you know, as I'm saying, reality has gone out the window here. Um, and she also went to a, uh, she wanted to go to a late night show in Burbank, and she was escorted off the premises by a security guard due to disruptive behavior. So some people were, are trying to say, because she left Canada and went to California, and she, like, visited a few tourist places, she was just fine. No, 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 no. You can do things when you're psychotic, and especially if you're manic. You're going to run around doing all kinds of things, but it doesn't mean you're in reality, and that's just really important to know. Um, so, oh, hi, Lenny. You just showed up. You're late, but hey, you know, that's okay. Um, you can always go back and see what you missed. Um, it's recorded for everyone. Um, so anyway, I want first people to understand the manic state she is in. Now, um, the there's a very famous... 
a very famous video, which you can find, uh, I'll, I'll put a link below, um, but you can find it on the internet. And it is her in the elevator. Um, see if I got the right one here. There we are. Okay, it's kind of blurry, but okay, here it is. Essentially what happens is she go, gets into the elevator over here and she starts pushing buttons, like all of them. Well, actually the first time she pushed like half of them. And then she she's hiding in the corner and she's like looking for somebody who's after her. And then she goes out. You can see her peeping out, you know, it's like, and, and who's there? And then she goes back into the elevator and she hits like all of the buttons. And then she steps out again and she's doing this thing with her hands. You know, that's very significant. That's not a normal behavior. This is very much connected to psychotic behavior. So she's paranoid. She thinks she's, she's seeing things that aren't there. Her hands are going in strange motions, which are not normal motions. Something is wrong with this girl. And then when she gets, and then this is the last she's seen. And then next you find she's in the cistern on the roof. Okay, so I wanna, I wanna go over to some comments that were made over on um, uh, Dr. Grande's site because um, he did this case and talked about her issues. And it's very good, so I'm also put a link below uh, about him talking about her issues. Um, and recently I just put, uh, so, if you remember, um, the family who went for a hike uh, in the desert and they all, all four of them, were, they were all dead. The husband the wife, the baby, and the dog. I said, so those four were dead. A lot of people thought something really weird happened. And I said, no, 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 that's called heat stroke. You know, they're up, they, they left with 75 degree temperature, but by the time they got where they were going, it was nearly a hundred and they didn't get back, they didn't have enough water. I said, it's heat stroke. I got a lot of flack from that. Um, but there are people who said, and I, one of you guys, and I can't, I'm trying to remember who it was, said, doesn't it seem like people who don't know, have never experienced heat stroke, think it isn't heat stroke? But those people who have experienced heat stroke say it's heat stroke. Well, just recently, um, somebody alerted me to the fact that the police have finally released some phone messages that that family had left saying, we're in trouble, can you help? Uh, the baby's overheating. There was the proof. So absolutely, they died of heat stroke. Now. If you have never had a problem with psychotic behavior, if you've never worked with people who have psychotic behavior, you may not think this, she could do the things that she could do, like go out a fire escape, which is what they think happened, and go up to the roof and decide to hide in a cistern and drown. You think, oh, that's impossible. Listen to what some of these people said. Norma says, I'm a retired psychiatric nurse, took care of hundreds of psychotic and or manic patients over a 20 year period. The elevator footage is familiar behavior to me, especially the hand motions and appearing to hide in the corner. This unfortunate lady died as a result of her mania. Okay, next person. <laughs> Brett says, I thought this was kind of funny. I really wish I'd watched this instead of season one of the new Netflix show about the Cecil. Because I guess they have, they're doing all the Cecil creepy stuff. As a person who has been diagnosed with bipolar disorder, I knew mania-induced psychosis was to blame as soon as I saw the elevator footage. Then next one, I'm bipolar, this is Jillian, and take only one of the same medications as Alyssa. I take Lamictal, and I also take Trazodone, a non-SSRI antidepressant. SSRIs can definitely push bipolar people over the edge. And she was way over medicated. Uh, that absolutely led to her death. It's no wonder she was losing it. All those drugs and her poor brain didn't know what to do with it. Next person. I've had a manic episode one time. I was super scared that someone from the government was the reason my mind was going through that episode. Racing thoughts, panic attacks that were almost unbearable in the morning when I woke up. That got better throughout the day, but would spike before bed. I would always think I could just kill myself if it gets too bad. If it gets too bad, you uh, may decide to do something. David Brown, I'll leave the name of my son, but it has nothing to do with my son. That is not my son. <laughs> Alyssa Lamb was actively psychotic, manic, decompensating. Decompensating is when you're starting to fall apart, going downhill. Dancing in the lobby, hyper-focused on the weight of a book, 
where she had someone carry it for her to the hotel and had stopped taking her medications. This is no mystery. She likely thought she was hiding from a non-existent pursuer. Yes. Um, and there's a very interesting thing that happens with people. Um, Anne says, now you have to be careful of this, Anne. My son is bipolar, rapid cycle, age 38. He cycles every month. I've never seen him do any of those things. Doesn't mean other people don't. And this is one thing we have to be careful of. Our experiences are not everybody else's experiences. I just read to you a whole bunch of people who have had experiences like that or have worked with people who've had those experiences. I've worked in the psych wards. I've seen it over and over and over again. So if your son doesn't experience that, that's good. Because not, you know, it's not, it's not a, no, it's not like a, everybody's on the same plane. There's all kinds of different kinds of things that happen with people's psych, psychiatric conditions and the medicines they take and how they interact. What's clear here is this is not normal behavior. She's having a manic psychotic episode. She is. Um, and it is a very unusual thing, but very true, that there's some weird thing that goes on in people's brains where they like to go into small places. I, I, I don't know what it is. The, t the, the desire to hide in like little places where you're confined, where people can't get to you. Um, there was another uh, story about a young man who was at a nightclub and went into the wall and then he got further and further into the wall and he finally died of um, a positional asphy asphyxiation. Basically, he just got <laughs> crushed um, and couldn't breathe well enough. Uh, not crushed, but just, you know, just there's so much pressure on you, you just don't have enough air coming in and eventually you pass out and then you just die. Um, amazing how many young people end up in um, trash bins, big trash bins. They climb into them to go to sleep. They climb into them to hide. They end up dead in them. It's, 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 it's peculiar, but it's there and it's true. And one of the things with her is there's no evidence of anybody else being involved with this. And she, you know, she, when she went missing, she ends up in a place that nobody has any reason to put her in. Now let's take a look at, um, let me show you the, the, uh, the, the roof again. Um, let me show you where she ended up. Okay, so she's up here. These, these are the cisterns on the roof um, that they found her in. And here they are climbing up there. And so now she's, she's in one of those. Now, you know, it's very unlikely that somebody did something to her in the hotel and decided they're going to cart a dead body out onto a fire escape, up the fire escape, onto the roof, and into one of these things. It's just not something they do. And on top of that, you know, their clothes were with her, uh, although she was naked, so probably she felt hot or she thought they would be better, you know, for whatever reason, to be taken off. Her phone was there. Everything was, you know, her. It, it, it's so bizarre that this is just not something that makes any sense that anybody did to her. Um, and uh, there's no evidence of sexual assault. So, you know, when, when you have a precipitating incident right before something happens, usually it's that precipitating incident that tells you what happened. I mean, there are weird occasions where it's not true, where somebody, had, you know, go, maybe the person's having issues and then they run into somebody who tries to help them and then they help them into, you know, murder. <laughs> you know, they murder them um, and they're just vulnerable victims. That does happen. But when you have a, an incident like this, you have this behavior and then she vanishes um, and ends up in such a strange situation and there's nothing linking anybody else to that. You know, sometimes it just is what it is. And, and because it's so weird, there's an inability to accept it for what it is. Um, although I will say that this particular instance, many more people are accepting of this one than the Phoebe Hansjuk incident. So now I'm going to, I'm doing a, this is all I'm going to do on this case. Uh, there's really nothing more to say. I do think she was in, uh, in a, a psychotic state. I think she, she went up there. I don't know that she was trying to commit suicide. She may have just been hiding. You know, I really think she might've been hiding in her own state of mind, thinking she was getting away from somebody and this was a good place to go. And uh, you know, we just can't see inside a mind that has got a completely different landscape than what you're seeing. She's not seeing what you're seeing. You're not seeing what she's seeing. So, you know, she may have been climbing a mountain and hiding in a cave, except that it wasn't, you know, in her own mind. So let's go to the other case because 
Now we get into something a lot trickier. <laughs> a whole lot trickier and a whole lot more controversy over. All right, so now we have the Phoebe Hans Hansjack case. This is in Melbourne, Australia. And let me see if I can just give you the basics on this. This is going to be... I'm just going to get to it. I'll just get to it uh, because it's it's fascinating. And I just... Ah, did I just knock off the page I wanted to look at? <laughs> Hold on a second. I just did that to myself. I was, just, I was just aiming to click on the page and it went missing because I hit the wrong button. As I usually do. Okay, hold on one second. Let me see if I can get it back. Ah, so annoying when that happens. All right, let's see if I can get Phoebe back. I had the particular one I wanted to use as uh, my um, information page. Okay, I'll, okay, this I'll use this one. This comes from a site actually called uh, PhoebeHandsJuck.com. Uh, and I do want to state that this is a very, very, this is a big, huge, um, you want to call a, um, a mystery. And when something becomes a mystery, usually the sites that do, do um, analysis of the mystery are usually aimed at saying what, hap what, the, what the authorities said happened didn't happen. It's usually also coming from the, the parents or the relative's agenda. Just to point that out, because this can sometimes influence how we think about any case, and I'll explain this as we go along. But basic information on Phoebe. What happened to Phoebe? This is Phoebe. She's got a lot of incarnations. She has lots of different looks. She's got blonde. She's got brown. She's uh, obviously uh, um, kind of a, you know, a fun person in, in many ways, um, and a, a person who enjoys life in many ways. But I'm going to explain more about her predicament as far as her mental health goes. Okay, basic information. On the evening of the 2nd of December 2010, 24-year-old Phoebe Hansjuk was found dead on the floor of the refuse compactor room at the bottom of the Balencia, a luxury high-rise apartment building located on St. Kilda Road, Melbourne. It was discovered she had fallen feet first from the 12th floor refuse room. I think that's how you say it, uh, down the waste disposal shaft to the compactor below. The toxicology report revealed Phoebe to have a blood alcohol reading of 0.16% and high levels of uh, prescription drugs. Uh, by the way, 0.16%, I believe, is three times the uh, level of uh, you know, drunk driving, you know, three times the level of legal, drunk, legal driving there. Uh, there have been no... There have been no, no known reported incidents of a cause of death such as this in the history of Australia. I'll get back to that. On, on the 7th of December, homicide detectives said that no second party was involved in Phoebe's death. She had entered the chute feet first voluntarily. Uh, and then Phoebe's grandfather, retired Detective Sergeant Lauren Campbell, had suspicions regarding the circumstances surrounding her death from the outset. He began to ask questions of the police and to make his own inquiries. So there was an inquest, uh, and I have some information from the inquest. So anyway, that's the basics. Now, I want to go back to this. Uh, first of all, I want to talk about her mental health, and I want to talk about incidents of trash shoots. <laughs> all right, let's look at her mental health first. Because like, like Alyssa Lamb, her mental health has is important because... You know, that was one of the, quote, motives for what happened to her and one of the explanations for what happened to her. So the question is, did that actually impact what happened to her? So uh, let me let me just read to you. Um, one second, let me find where I just put it. All right. About her her um, her history. All right. So. Hold on one second, let me find it. Where did it go? It was just here. Hold on one second. Okay, here we go. At age 15, Phoebe started hanging out with the wrong crowd, experimenting with drugs like alcohol, speed, ecstasy, and methamphetamine. I'm sorry, sorry. <laughs> 
That was a mistake. <laughs> Marijuana. <laughs> Sorry, Phoebe. I'm not trying to like add on things you didn't do. Let me rephrase that. Drugs like alcohol, speed, ecstasy, and marijuana. She ran away from home and lived in a squat in the city's north for eight weeks with an ex-prisoner, his partner, and their baby. After returning home, she began taking antidepressants to curb her mood swings. By age 16, Phoebe was in a relationship with a teacher who was almost twice her age, starting a pattern for falling in love with older men. At the same time, she was struggling to deal with the decline of her parents' ma marriage. Somebody who was a friend of hers said it was her, oh, maybe it was her mother, uh, Natalie, said it was her intolerance for alcohol in particular that was responsible for driving her off course. There are people who can't cope with it and she was one of them. She was too sensitive, she was affected too quickly and easily. I'm gonna stop right here. If her mommy's saying this, mommy, your daughter had problems before she touched alcohol. You know, the concept that you take a, you, you just happen to like have a drink one day and you went off your, not, no. She had severe problems. She's running away from home at a very young age, living with people she shouldn't be with, doing a tremendous amount of drugs and alcohol. This was not about alcohol. This is about, she had issues and issues within the family. So you're trying to um, basically state that it wasn't a family problem. It was a just a, a substance abuse problem. And I'm sorry, but substance abuse comes after problems at home and problems with you know your own uh, emotional state that's why you go to alcohol and drugs otherwise you wouldn't need to use them so that that really concerns me that this is this is the concept that's coming um from the family so anyway yeah natalie is her mom i just want to make sure i read that right so anyway she goes on about life and eventually she hooks up with um with a guy named Anthony Hampel, and, Ant, and that's what the guy they call Ant, all right? And um, she, Anthony says that Phoebe's drinking problem was the monster. Well, that was what she chose to do, to use to, to um, kill the pain she was feeling for whatever she, reason she was feeling it. They met in 2009, when he was almost 40 and she was 23, and she was working as a receptionist at a hair salon. Um, and she, so she, he, she, he, uh, he met her there. He was handsome, smart, uh, pr events promoter, and he had money and glamorous friends. Dude had, dude had cash. Um, they went out for five months before Phoebe moved into his St. Kilda Road apartment in 2009. Okay? So she, she eventually told her mother. Uh, oh, Natalie says um, her mother. Her daughter drank to overcome her social insecurities around Hample and his friends who were older. Again, mom blames everybody else, but what was baby happening in her life growing up? And, the re and her own personal problems. It's always somebody else's fault. The people she got hooked up with, alcohol, now the older guy. She chose the older guy. The older guys, I'm not saying Anthony Hample, aunt, wasn't like, like in young women who have issues because maybe he does like to control them. Maybe he's like, hey, I got a hot babe and she needs me. So, you know, some guys like that. But she's also choosing him. Anyway, she once called her mom in distress. She said, mom, I just don't know what to do. I love Ant, but it's not working. Phoebe walked out on Hample four times in the six weeks before she died. She left him four times only for him to convince her to return. So she says, maybe she couldn't do without him either. You know, maybe that was the problem. He was a very controlling person and he was a friend of mine, said Godfrey. I felt sorry for him because I feel he was in love with her and he was losing her. Some would think he was losing her, he killed her, right? All right, so the girl had problems. She had problems since she was 15. For 10 years of her life, she'd been struggling with lots of problems. So we just got to keep that in mind. Now, also to keep in mind, um, let's see if I can find this here. Okay, I want to go back up here in a minute. I want to point out what the psychiatrist said. Okay, hold on. I just messed my spot up. I hate it when I do that. Okay. All right. Uh, I'm going to go back here. Okay. No, I'm not going to go back there. I'm going to go back here. 
I'll be there in a minute. Just hang on. All right. This is what the psychiatrist said. All right. At the time of her death, she was taking antidepressants, which had been prescribed by her general practitioner, something that never, ever should happen. No general practitioner has any business giving antidepressants, any kind of psychiatric drugs. He's not a psychiatrist. If he does that, I think he should lose the license. Um, I think it's ridiculous. That should only come from a psychiatrist who's having her under weekly care, if not bi-weekly care. All right. Um, uh, Phoebe's alcohol problems and depressions were a factor in the determination of her death being a suicide. Also, Phoebe's grandmother, Mrs. Campbell, referred to seeing a cut on Phoebe's wrist approximately nine months before her death, but Phoebe told her at the time she was not trying to hurt herself and she was not suicidal. Okay, sure. Um, in statements uh, to the police, Phoebe's mother and Mr. Campbell also referred to Phoebe having previously cut herself. So that is a sign of something there. Um, in his statement to police, uh, Mr. Hampel concluded, I believe the result of Phoebe's depression and alcohol use made her take her life tonight. Also, there were, there were discussions that a friend had with Phoebe about self-mutilation and self-loathing. Okay, and then uh, on Tuesday, the 30th of November, Phoebe telephoned her psychologist, Miss Young, in a distressed state. Telephone records revealed that uh, they, okay, they had also called Alfred Hospital and the High Street Medical Center to report that she's having some issues. During the conversation, Phoebe told her that she felt extremely distressed about relationship issues, was drinking heavily, and felt unsafe. Which unsafe usually means possibly su actively suicidal. Okay, so, so her, her, her mental health was not good, all right? Uh, Ann says her father was a psychiatrist. Well, that may have lent to the problem. <laughs> and, okay, I'm going to get to this. Okay, now here we, here we go. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get to this in a minute because this is, this is where things go wrong. This is where absolutely things go wrong. Lisa says, Ant is a suspicious character. He's her boyfriend. He's an older dude who's, you know, maybe, yeah, I get it. He lives with her. He was in the apartment that she went out of some way or in some way, shape, or form and ended up going down the chute. Suspicious. Okay, I'm okay with that. Now, Anne says his ex-girlfriend was found dead. Red flag. I'm going to get to that and you're going to find out that this is the stuff that the media does that's a lie. Okay. All right. Now. All right, let me go on now. <clears throat> All right, let me first talk about, I'm going to get to the girl, the, the, first, the, the other girlfriend in a minute. But first I want to talk about this. I watched a show, and I don't recommend it, but you can watch it. I'm not going to stop you. <laughs> okay, the show is Under Investigation, Murder or Suicide, Girl Down the Shoot. This is 60 Minutes Australia. Okay. This is the kind of show that I absolutely despise. It is an agenda-driven show that is meant to get viewers and is done pretty, all from one's, one point of view, which happens to be the grandfather and, his, and the mother and the investigation where they believe their daughter, the, the, uh, that uh, Phoebe was murdered. I'm okay with them doing a show that explores the possibility of being murdered. What bothers me is they didn't bother with anything that wasn't coming from that point of view. So it's a very slanted show. Okay, so now, remember that thing about there was no such cases in, in Australia? Well, maybe not, but get this. Yeah, here we go. All right, let me, let me find my spot here. All right, and I love this. This guy wrote, and this guy's name is Tim. I don't know who Tim is. <laughs> Tim, but Tim pointed out something very interesting. I saw a very interesting and tragic tale on 60 Minutes Australia the other night. It described how Phoebe Hansjuk had been living in an apartment building and somehow died after a fall of 30 meters down a garbage chute. I was just going to give it a mention, but then I saw a few similar cases and it appears garbage chute deaths are not all that rare. I have placed a link to 60 Minutes video I watched. Oh, sorry. I have placed a link to the 60 Minutes video I've watched. Basically, this young Sydney, Australia woman, 24, is said to have drunk too much and taken sleeping pills. Um, um, we'll get into that. Um, um, 
dangerous kind of sleeping pills. And then she climbed into a small garbage chute. She fell 30 meters down into the garbage room. This was the 2nd December uh, 2010. To add to the tragedy, she survived that but bled to death due to her wounds. No one could hear her, and she tried to get out of the room and died. All right. Her family has been spearheading a campaign to have her death classified as murder. I admit there is a certain cause for suspicion. I'm okay with that too. One of the reasons they found her death suspicious that was once down in the basement, Phoebe tried to get out. As her death was said to have been a possible suicide, they reasoned that if it was the case, why would she try to survive? A handprint and blood was found on the inside of the door. I can counter this with my own experience of many cases. Once an attempt at suicide fails or the person realizes that they might die, they often seek assistance. This is true. So just because she survived the fall and then was in horrible condition and bleeding and in pain doesn't and was trying to get out of the room and get help doesn't mean she wasn't suicidal. It just means at that moment she realized, oh my God, that happens quite often. So that is, that is absolutely not meaningful. Now, this is another good point this guy made, Tim. A good part of the suspicion is how she could have climbed in by herself while drunk. I now see other cases through, though, where people have done just that. Take, for example, a New York tragedy. Lara Prajotko, 48, was seen on CCTV footage drunkenly exit, exiting an elevator in her luxury apartment block in July 2018. Next thing, her body was found in the garbage compactor in the basement. Another case is Lisa Maria Hernandez, 34, found in the shoot of her building in uh, Staten Island in January of 2021. This has been determined an accident. The lady apparently died of positional asphyxia and had alcohol and cocaine in her system. I had a random search on Google and found the case of an 80-year-old and a 16-year-old who were also killed from such falls in Chicago. The 60 Minutes program made no mention of these other deaths. I find that strange as my uncovering of the above took 15 minutes and I would have researched the topic if I had been doing a documentary. This bothers me. I also looked up things and let's see, what have we got here? Oh yes, Justine Gross. Police rule out foul play and death of New Jersey college student who fell down a trash chute. How about this one? Mother, I'm not sure if this is the same one. Mother fell 27 stories down a garbage chute in her Manhattan apartment building. Now, take a look at that, at that garbage chute. It looks almost like the one we're seeing in the Australia case. And also, something to note about her body. See how, how thin she is and see how flat-chested? I'm telling you, if you have big boobs, you can't go in there. But flat-chested women have a better shot of, of being able to get into that little, little place. He's right, though. The Australia, they weren't being even-handed. They're basically saying, oh, see, there's nothing like this. This is a once-in-a-lifetime type of thing. No, there's many cases of people going down garbage chutes. It's true. And there were, they were not murders. So this is not, this is not a good explanation for why this isn't isn't um, uh, a suicidal death or an accident. It's not accidental. If you Most likely it's suicidal. But the fact she tried to escape the room later after she was still alive and tried to then get help doesn't mean she didn't make an attempt at a suicide. Secondly, just because she, it was a weird situation doesn't mean she wasn't attempting suicide. So those are all reasons we can, we can throw those all away. That's my point. Throw those all away because there's no proof in that. And it bugs me when you're going to, if you're going to use something to prove something is not so, don't use something that just isn't evidence. If these two things aren't evidence, let's go to the third thing. And this is all about, um, let's take a look at the one who is in, is, is most likely it's, it's, it's almost very unlikely this would be a stranger homicide over a homicide that just for some weird reason some dude just came up didn't sexually assault her but just decided to stuff her down a trash chute for no reason so we can pretty much throw that out it's either a suicide or some kind of psychotic thing where she's climbing into a, a hidey place or her boyfriend killed her those are the two so let's stay with the two and not go someplace sillier okay so here they are this is aunt as they call them in this case, you can see Aunt. Here's Aunt. 
he loved her, or at least in his own way, he loved her. She apparently loved him in her own way, whatever that was. All right. So the question is, could, it, could he have done something to her? Okay. And that's a very reasonable question. That's why this is such a suspicious case, because it's such a weird crime. He could theoretically have killed her. So let's go and look at things. Now, remember the comment? What was, that? What was this comment over here? Yes, okay, so, so the comment is this. Anne says, his ex-girlfriend was found dead. Red flag. Oh, you better believe this has been everywhere on the internet. Oh my goodness, everywhere on the internet. That he, he oh, now mind you, this is the first one who died. And then later on, it was years later, he hooked up with another young one. And she died, okay, uh, of a strangulation or with a, with a, with a gold, gold thing tied around her neck. Okay. If you go through most of the Internet, you will not get the actual story behind this. And this is where it really ticks me off because I don't mind speculation, but I mind lies. And I mind, I mind, I mind when it, the proper information isn't put out there. So let's take a look at this girl. All right, so... Here's the other girl. All right, here she is. Oops, is that her? No, sorry. Here she is. <laughs> okay, let me tell you who this girl is. All right, this girl is, let me find her. Okay, let me go to my notes now. All right, her name is Bailey Petra Schneider. Uh, she was a stripper and she died from asphyxiation by a court. However, that's not all there is to this. Okay, so let's go on about this. All right. So, let me find a story about her. All right. Here is the real story, and I'm going to, this is why it's so annoying to me. 25-year-old Bailey Petra Schneider grew up in Queensland, Australia. At the age of 19, she moved to Melbourne, where she enrolled in a dental assistant program and worked part-time as a fashion merchandiser. So far, so good. Bailey's stunning good looks brought her modeling gigs and an entrance into the nightclub scene, where she was introduced to cocaine and binge drinking. Eventually, she became riddled with anxiety and was prescribed Zoloft and antidepressants. Believe me, this girl had problems way before she went there. Uh, in 2017, Bailey's parents moved to Melbourne, to help her get her life back on track. She moved in with him, enrolled in an applied medical sciences program, and took a new job in dental practice. In early 2018, Bailey returned home from a short modeling gig in Bali and announced she was dating 51-year-old Anthony Hampel. Our Anthony. All right, now, uh, so let's go on. on. On This is eight years later. Okay, on June 22nd, 2018, Bailey told her parents she was going to a barbecue at Anthony's home and would be spending the night. Instead, she went to a nightclub where she worked as a dancer, stripper, from 6.45 p.m. to 1 a.m. Um, at 1.08 a.m., Bailey took a taxi to the elite and prestigious suburb of Turak for a party. She spent the majority of the night arguing with Anthony via text. Her friends noted that she seemed very depressed. Uh, yeah. At 8 a.m., Bailey took a taxi back home. At 10 a.m., Bailey's mother found her sobbing in her bedroom in the midst of a panic attack. Bailey told her mom she and Anthony had broken up because their worlds were just too different. Uh, she was, um, unfortunately... Um, she was a stripper, and stripper usually comes with, uh, somebody's going to argue with me, but usually comes with prostitution. Because usually if you're a stripper and you don't make the men happy after hours, they fire you. So that's just my personal opinion, but people can ignore that. But anyway, after consoling Bailey for some time, now this is where it gets really important. After consoling Bailey for some time, her parents left to get groceries. Bailey was on the couch watching a movie on Netflix while her older brother, um, okay, while her older brother was in his, Ryan was in his room at the back of the house. 
When Bailey's parents returned a short time later, they found her lying on the kitchen floor. Her head was leaning against a lower cabinet. Blood was dripping from her nose and a curtain tie from her bedroom was tightly knotted around her neck. Bailey's dad cut the curtain tie off with a knife and attempted to administer CPR, but it was too late. Bailey was dead. Bailey had traces of cocaine, Zoloft, and Xanax in her system. Her blood alcohol concentration was 0.17, three times the legal driving limit, very similar to Phoebe. A half-empty bottle of wine was found in the kitchen. The coroner ultimately ruled her death a suicide by compression of the neck. He assessed that the sudden breakdown of her relationship and the concoction of alcohol and antidepressants led her to hang herself. However, Bailey was only 172 centimeters tall and there was nowhere for her to suspend herself in the kitchen, so they claim. Um, but the coroner concluded she must have hung herself from the pantry door. It's the only viable solution. Now, mind you, again, it's, it, you don't have to jump off something like a chair. You don't have to be hanging with your feet in the air. All you have to do is put the thing around your neck, bend your knees, and when the blood can't come back to your brain, it just presses here, you just pass out, and you're... And because you're unconscious, you can't push your feet up and, and you, you can't recover, so you die. Bailey's older brother, Ryan, last saw his sister in the garden talking on the phone. She said he, she appeared distressed but made a hand gesture signaling she was okay. Anthony was the last known person who have spoken with Bailey, just like in the case of Phoebe Hansjuk. Okay, however, he was nowhere near the house. <laughs> You know, her parents, the parents had gone out to buy some groceries. Her brother was home. She hung herself. There is no way he left. She was on the phone with him and somewhere he flew over in a helicopter, jumped out, ran in, went into her bedroom, grabbed a, uh, something off the a thing from the curtain and then strangled her with her brother in the house and then snuck out before the parents returned home with groceries. Come on now. This is insane. This is ridiculous. This is the kind of stuff that... 60 Minutes doesn't tell you that all these websites don't tell you. He did not kill this girl. This girl was not killed by him. This girl killed herself. Now, he obviously has a penchant for disturbed young women who have emotional problems. Maybe he's one of those, I want to save you. You want to save your guys. Maybe he's one of those control freaks who knows if the girl is desperate, she'll stay with him and he can control her because she's so desperate. But that he might be a rotten egg. I'm not going to say, I don't know what kind of guy he is, but he didn't kill this girl. He didn't. There's no way in God's earth he killed her. He could have, you know, contributed to her emotional instability, if you want to go there. But he didn't kill her. She killed herself. So the nonsense that he is like this, this serial girlfriend killer is garbage. It's not true. He didn't do it. So, so let's get away from that. Uh, and that's, but, you know, but Anne, I understand why you believe that. I understand why you believe that because everything on the internet, almost everything, doesn't tell you the true story about how she died. So, of course, you're going to think, oh, Jesus, he must have killed her too. So, um, no, he didn't give, no, he didn't do that, Anne. Those were given to the girls by their stupid psychologists, their, their medical practitioners who weren't paying any attention to them. They were being given a tremendous amount of psych, uh, psycho, uh, psychiatric drugs by a person who should not be handing them out. If you're not under constant psychiatric care, you should not be on medications. If you need that kind of medication, fine, but you should be under care. And these girls, you know. Now, was he a good guy? I don't know. He, must have been, he might have been a total creepo, Ann. That's not the point. The point is when we're talking about homicide, you know, first of all, understand the girls already made their, they girls made a lot of choices in their life that weren't good from way back when. They were, they were disturbed teenagers. They were drug using teenagers way back when. And then they chose him to hang out with. Not saying he's a good guy. I'm not. But that has nothing to do with necessarily him committing homicide. Okay, you can. I say you can. You can say that he's a creep, but hey, that's a whole nother issue. That is not a crime. You know, it's unfortunate. It's not a crime. All right. So, all right. So there we go. All right. So, no, there is absolutely not. So that's it. So that's it. You know, I say that we have to make sure that. All right. Uh, the answer to this, Lisa, is yes. She absolutely went down the chute. 
and she was found on the floor. She tried to get out. Nobody's questioning that she went down the chute. The question is how she got into the chute and who, if she put herself in or somebody else put her in. Okay, so that to me is, is right away something we need to understand. Now, just to go back, um, I want to I point out again some, she was taking a drug that in the U.S. is known as Ambien. And as one guy says, Ambien ain't no joke. I had to quit the stuff because of the dangerous things I do while blacked out on it, things I could seriously have died doing. Somebody else said, yeah, that pill she took is the same as Ambien, a hypnotic. My doctor gave me Ambien for insomnia in the early 90s. I would never wake up where I went to sleep. I, I, I would wake up under a computer desk, in the bathroom, in the kitchen. I stopped taking them when I woke up on the garage floor of my pajamas with my car keys in my hand, having no memory of what happened. Still knocks. That's the other, that's the, I think, Australian word for Ambien. And this is what? Now, let's go away from... Uh, the other girlfriend who absolutely was not killed by Anthony. Uh, so let's go back to let's go back to Phoebe uh, because this is this is really about what happened. Uh, sorry, what happened? Where, where's my Phoebe pictures? My Phoebe pictures. Okay, there we go. Phoebe, what happened to Phoebe? And was her was her boyfriend involved with what happened to Phoebe? All right. Um, this person said they ended up driving their car to their friend's house and can't even remember it. Um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of, there's so many stories about Ambien. Um, it induces psychosis, hallucinations, etc. Not saying it's an explanation. In this case, this is what somebody's writing. But it's a medication that I and many colleagues refuse to prescribe. Now, this is somebody in the field who says, I'm not prescribing this crap because it's dangerous. Now, you have, you have three times the alcohol level you should have in your body for driving and you're taking Stillnox slash Ambien at the same time. It's not good. Okay. So now I want to go to the day it happened, all right? So she was severe. Let me just say this, first of all. Yes, she had the mental condition for a, a possible suicide attempt. She did. So, so anybody who says she didn't is full of it. She did. She was suicidal. She was depressed because she loved Anthony and she kept trying, leaving him and, and coming back and leaving him and coming back, whatever. It was a, not a healthy relationship but she was in it um so she was having psychological problems and then on top of that she was taking medications that were dangerous for people with psychological problems so things that can set you into a psychotic state oh so let's take a look at what she wrote the night before she died she wrote hi family I'm in bed and about to sleep, and when I wake, I will transform into the most incredible human being you'll ever see. Not. Nah. I will go to the hospital. It's safer there. And I hear the special tonight is tomato soup. Delicious, nutritious. I love you all very much, but not enough to send on an individual text. Um, sorry about that, but time is sleep, and I must be on my way. Merrily, 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 life is but a dream. Okay. This is not a healthy thing. Her family was like, what the hell? And they contacted Anthony and said, there's something weird going on here. And he said, oh, I think she's fine. It was the last text they would receive from her. That is not normal text. She was saying she's in trouble right there and then. Okay, so now we go to the day of what happened to her. Now, she lived in this very, very fancy, slick apartment. And this is going to be important um, as far as... Uh, some of the evidence goes. This is going to be important. That's a, this is a high-end luxury apartment. Last time she was like seeing walking her dog. There was a fire alarm. Anyway, she went out and walked a dog, and then and she wasn't seen again. And this was early in the day. Like Anthony had gone to work. There's no question he'd gone to work. He was away at work all day long. She was theoretically at home or dead at some point um, from the trash chute, or she was alive when Anthony got home. Now. Um, they, there's questions about the, the, what's happened in the house. Uh, it's, it's very confusing. Uh, it's, there isn't, the inquest information is much better. And I, I was going to, I have the whole inquest stuff written down here, but I don't know if I want to go into all of it right now. So there was some broken glass in the apartment. There were supposedly a couple of glasses out. Uh, some of her blood was here on, on this, you know, she was using like a mouse on a keyboard thing. Um, and some of her blood was there. Theoretically, she she broke a glass 
and and, and breaking the glass um she uh maybe have cut herself. And there were a couple drops in the ref, the room that the that the uh, trash chute was in that she would have gone into. So theoretically that's her, and it was her blood. So the question is, did she break a glass and she should try to clean it up and take take it down to the, to the, some of it, take it down to the room and the refuse room and open up the trash chute and throw it in and then say, yeah, I'm garbage too. And then decide she's gonna kill herself. Don't know. Or was some people would say, well, Anthony got home. They had a fight. There was throwing. He threw a glass. She threw a glass. She got cut. And then he decided to, to offer and take her down to the room and, and uh, dump her in the, in the thing. Okay. So, sorry. This is driving me crazy here. Hold on one second. I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do it. Do a, you know, I have these. You know, I have these things to glue glue my clothes on. This is what they this is what models do. You know, like you put things under here to keep your clothes like in where they're supposed to be, and then they don't work. So then they start driving you nuts. So <laughs> little wardrobe disaster. Mm, okay. Anyway, I know you have to have one disaster per show, right? One disaster per show. So this is going to be a wardrobe disaster, and hopefully not an internet disaster. I'd rather have the wardrobe issue. Okay. So oh great, now I all right. So now. So here's here's the issue. All right. Let's look. Uh, let's look. okay. So so something happened in the apartment. Whether she she was drunk off her butt and all messed up and angry, smashed something. She was drinking. Um, why there's two glasses? Who knows? Maybe she put one out thinking he was going to come home and they were going to drink together. Maybe she wanted two glasses to drink from. Maybe who knows? I mean, you know, you're drunk off your butt. You think you know differently. And then she's got this uh, still. What is it called again? I call it Ambien, uh, in her system too. So she's kind of messed up. Okay, she's messed up. And so obviously she cuts herself and she's still got her, she's touching this over here for some reason. Anyway, so at some point she ends up in the refuse room and where that, that chute is. Now, okay, here is the point. Let me get the timing here because the timing is going to be very critical. All right. Now, let's see how this works. Okay. She had to go into the chute prior to 7.11 p.m. Now, most likely even prior to 7.06. Uh, the police got called uh, by this lady who had found her, you know, lying, lying dead in there. And she had called as, as early as 7.04. So it's a little question about that. Um, but if she went in, in at 704, um, yeah, the, if the woman made the call at 704, she had to even go into the chute before 704. So we're talking, she had to go down the chute and she had to bleed out and we could give you five or 10 minutes. So maybe even back to seven o'clock on that, that she would be already in the chute at seven o'clock. All right. The detective showed up at 718. Now, there was a big issue about how the the detectives didn't let the uh, paramedics in to disturb the crime. Uh, because they said, said, are you going to disturb the crime scene? Now, a lot of people are real upset about that. Well, they could have saved her life. Well, I'm going to say, from what I read in the inquest, she was in a cyanotic state. In other words, she looked dead. And, you know, if you're a paramedic, the paramedic said this from looking in through the door. She's like, mm, she did. <laughs> she was definitely, her face was, you know, she was turned blue. And she's clearly dead dead you know so once you know that somebody is dead dead I mean you probably don't have to do any life-saving procedures um, she's dead now you can argue whether these paramedics should still come in but they didn't want the crime scene disturbed so usually what happens is when you got a person ser seriously dead it's better not to have extra people in there so this I think it's all a bunch of crap so the girl was dead dead all right now there was also there was a question about um, exactly how she fell down the thing. Feet first. Nobody questions that she went down feet first. Um, and let me show you just a. Okay, so it's this this thing over here. Um, the, you know she she would have to open it and then go into it. And I'll show you some things that her her grandfather, the ex ex detective, thinks happened or couldn't have happened. Um, she would go down feet first. Um, nobody questions that. The question would be whether she had her arms above her head or she could have them by her side because the police believe she wasn't in a free fall, that she tried to stop herself going down 
and and it's all but others believe she was had her hands up and couldn't have pushed against the side enough to cause any kind of stoppage on the way that's there's a i say a minor argument over that and i don't know that that has any great um importance gosh this is driving me nuts what in the heck i may have to get up and fix my clothes it's just driving me crazy maybe i'll put my sweater back on <laughs> oh my goodness okay hold on a second here i'm gonna put the sweater on then i don't have to play with a stupid shirt anymore all right i don't know what's going wrong here today but there i don't have to there we go all right all right so now let's look at the problem here all right let's first i want to show you what what the nope, that's not it that's not it okay here we are okay now the the grandfather wanted to prove that she could not have gotten into that that thing by herself so here he's got this girl she's climbing in you can see she's trying to get her foot in and then she's got to get her hands up and they're trying to hold the door open for her um this this little exhibition was done twice um let me show you the other one um there were two versions of this and this is the other version this one's a little clear actually you can see this girl's trying to get in and and she's struggling a little bit to try to get in there try to get her hands up and then try to get through that um so what the grandfather believes is it was impossible for for phoebe by herself in her state to climb up and get in there without help because these people you know they're trying to help her get in by holding the, the door open and all that because it was a struggle to get in okay so first let me let me examine was it a struggle to get in well I'm sure it wasn't easy, but you know, determined people do weird, weird stuff. And also when you're drunk off your butt and your half of you is kind of half numb, if you can get your butt up there and you're squashing your body and even you know, harming it in certain ways, you know, a lot of times you don't care if your face is smushed and other things happen, especially if you're suicidal, you will crush yourself into weird places. It happens. I'm sorry. It does happen. So she could have done it herself. I don't believe this for a minute that she couldn't have done it herself okay she could have now what's interesting to me and which is why i know this is all slight sleight of hand type of thing neither 60 minutes nor the grandfather did what they should have done which is why didn't they try to prove somebody else could have put her in there why don't we see that why don't we see a let's assume she she wasn't dead when she went in because she when she got to the bottom she was struggling to survive so she wasn't unconscious when she went in so if you have a non uh, conscious person and somebody's trying to shovel you into this little tiny place let's look let's look at this picture again somebody somebody has to somehow get her down the hall into that location either he's going to force her down the hall or he's got to carry her down the hall and i'll get to i'll get to that whole issue in a minute about the hallway uh, but let's just talk about this thing right now he's got to try to stuff her in there a living kicking human being i don't even care if she's drunk or half out of it she her body parts are moving and she could be you know pushing this way and pushing that way and not allowing him to put her leg in and meanwhile they're they're claiming that she couldn't have gotten in there by herself without extra hands where are his extra hands going to come in how is he going to hold that door open while he's trying to shovel her in there and she's not going to fight back I find that even more unrealistic. But do you see any, oh, did, is, is there, did 60 Minutes or this family try to prove that somebody else could have put her in there unconscious or conscious? We don't even see those demonstrations at all. If you're going to do a crime scene reenactment, you want to do each kind of crime scene reenactment. So you can say, well, this is, was difficult, but this was impossible. Or this was difficult, and this was difficult, but possible too. So could go either way we don't see any information on was it possible for somebody else to shovel her in there and that really disturbs me because we're getting then a very biased uh, uh look at this okay so as far as i'm concerned she could get in and they did prove she could get in i find it much more difficult to believe that somebody else could have pushed her in there if she was conscious very difficult to believe now let's still assume that it's doable because nobody did that and i I don't have a trash chute here and a person to help 
push me into something and I have big boobs. So I can't even, I can't go in and I don't know anybody with smaller boobs. So I, I can't help with the crime scene reenactment on this. But let's go to the timing issue and, and good old Anthony. And could he have done it? All right. Okay, let me go to my timing because this is where things get, it's very interesting to me. All right. 609 is when he arrives home okay this is his home he arrives home there is proof that he gets into the building at this point in time he goes into the building he goes up the elevator he goes to the apartment all right now mind you her body was found at 704 she had probably at least by seven o'clock already been down that chute so now we're talking about maybe 50 minutes okay is it possible within 50 minutes he could have something could have happened and then he took her down there and put her in the chute? Yes. Okay. But let's look at here. So he has to get home at 609. He has to go upstairs to the apartment. He has to greet Phoebe and get into an argument with her because there's got to be some reason why suddenly he needs to shove her, shove her down a trash chute. He supposedly loves her. He wants her to stay. You could say he didn't, if she was going to leave him, he wasn't going to allow her to leave him. If she was going to leave him, he, he makes sure she left him permanently. Uh, and that is a dangerous time for women. It could be true. It could be. Okay, let's let's look at it, though. He, now, she wasn't beaten. There was no obvious thing that she was beaten. She wasn't strangled. So she was still conscious. So he... You know, normally when people don't want you to leave them, they kill you. Then they get rid of your body. But she was definitely conscious when she went in the chute. So he didn't kill her. So he, they got in an argument. 609, he comes back. Hi, honey. It's now 610, 615. She's drinking. He's saying, what are you doing? They have an art. They fight. Now it's 625, 630. He still got, you know, maybe 30 minutes to kill her. No, he didn't kill her. See, he didn't kill her. Just to make her... I don't know. Force her down the hallway into a trash chute. Okay, let's keep going here. So now, one of the complaints, again, that you don't get the information. They complain, the family complains, that the police screwed up getting the, the, the CCTV. This is true. They asked the apartment for it. The apartment, they, they got a confused message. Somebody screwed up. Uh, they met, there was a communication issue, and the, and the CCTV was was written over and no longer was useful. What would the CCTV would have shown had they gotten it? They didn't, it wasn't important really what happened in the lobby, was it? They're trying to prove Anthony killed her. So he came into the lobby, everybody knew that. He went to the apartment, everybody knew that. The important part was from his apartment to the trash chute. The CCTV would have shown if he took her from the apartment to the trash chute. Now, let's think about this. This guy's lived in this apartment for a long time. He knows his CCTV. Do you honestly think that he's going to take a woman, kick, drag, drag a woman down a hall in front of the CCTV, take her into the trash chute room, come out without her, and not worry about the fact the police are going to be coming knocking on his door saying you killed her? I think he'd be an idiot. And if she was unconscious for a second, he'd be, he'd be shown carrying her down the hallway on his shoulder into the trash room from which she never appears because now she's found, you know, all that, you know, all the way down the trash chute all mangled up. Is he that much of an idiot? He doesn't think CCTV is going to catch him? And why, why, you know, the family's upset about the CCTV missing uh, the, the video missing because they wanted the shots. I would assume of the hallway where he'd be carrying her away. But he'd be an idiot to carry her down a hallway in front of CCTV. So I don't understand where this concept comes from, except they're not talking about that fact. All right. So now he's got to get her in there. Um, into this chute. Shovel her in there somehow. Meanwhile, there's broken glass in the apartment. He goes back to the apartment and doesn't bother to clean it up. I mean, if you want to, if you don't want people to think there was a, a fight of some sort, you'd clean that up right away. Apparently it wasn't cleaned up. He also wrote on the computer at 619, 
He arrives home. Ten minutes later, he's writing on the computer. Okay. And also he wrote on the computer at 7.01. So if he was up in the apartment at 7.01 writing on the computer, he must have just, what, wrote on the computer, grabbed her, ran down the hall, shoveled her down the thing, and ran back and wrote on the computer. He also made phone calls at 6.24 and at 6.52. So while he's in the middle of the argument, he makes a phone call. And while he's in the middle of taking her down the hall and putting her in the chute, he's also making a phone call. Okay. I'm going to say <laughs> this is not likely. This the, the whole scenario doesn't work really well. There was no evidence that anybody else was there. Now, people are saying, well, you know, there were no fingerprints on the chute, so somebody must have wiped them, wiped it clean. If you look at the inquest, they did do fingerprinting, and it came back. The problem was the type of material sometimes don't take fingerprints very well. That's the fact. So everybody thinks that, oh my God, if she were there, she'd have fingerprints every place and there would be proof that she, she was touching everything. Well, and so if it, hers weren't there and nobody is elsewhere, somebody had cleaned it down. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's just that fingerprints don't take on certain materials. So what, what we're seeing, if you go back, I'm going to put a link to the inquest because it's a lot of interesting information. When, when 60 Minutes and the family say they didn't do anything, this, this is just not true. The inquest is a lot of information about all the police work that was done. Did they make a few errors? Yes, they did. The communications about the CT, CCTV was de devastating because, in my opinion, it probably would have shown that she went down the hall by herself and was saved us all this trouble. But because the CCTV is missing, now they're going to claim Anthony took her down the hall. In front of... All those people in the apartments. Remember, this is not 1 o'clock in the morning. Look at the time frame. This is a time when people are coming home from work. The chances of him being able to take her down the hall to the trash chute and not be seen by somebody is very limited. Now, sometimes you get lucky. He could have maybe thought, well, I'll take her down, and if I, somebody sees me, I'll just turn around and go back and won't do it. But again, CCTV, people coming through, seriously unlikely. So... Yes, I wish we'd had the CCTV. It might have proven that she simply walked down there and did it to herself. Um, there is no evidence that Anthony did anything to her outside of being maybe a, a, an inappropriate boyfriend, you know, that maybe was not healthy for her. Um, she had the, to the, the, per, the psychological problems to commit suicide. She claimed she felt unsafe. She told, sent a weird email the night before. She was way over alcohol and, and medicated. So it's, and she could go into the shoot, and other people have done it just like her. So I don't see anything supporting that, uh, any kind of proof that her boyfriend aunt killed her. You know, and he certainly didn't kill the other girl. There was no way he, he was nowhere near the parents' house. And that's ridiculous. She, she, was, she killed herself while her brother was in the next room. So there, nobody came in and killed her. So that's just all nonsense. So I, at this point, I don't find much to support anything but a suicide. Um, now, by, mind you, I just want to give a little shout out to Dr. Grande. He also believes it's a suicide. Um, and he got attack like you would not believe in the comments uh, because he, they were, people were just so pissed off at him. And I looked at what he had to say and I'm like, you know, I, I know what I'm getting into because, you know, I've, I already did my own, um, my own analysis, but then I wanted to read up what he had to say. And I'm thinking, <laughs> you know, I'm just setting myself up for the same fate. <laughs> but Dr. Grande, I believe, is correct in this instance, um, and people need to stop attacking the poor man. Um, and please don't attack me either, because I will just have to block you off my channel. Um, you can disagree with me, but this is an educational channel, and I'm here to help you understand crimes and crime scene analysis and what we can base things on and what we can't. That's what I've done in this. There is no basis for any kind of... He, as I pointed out, he did not kill his, his, his later girlfriend. There's absolutely zero proof or any way he could have done it. So he's not a serial lady killer. He also doesn't really have a good motive outside of, she's leaving me and then I, I, I don't want her to leave me. And if I can't have you, nobody can. I'm okay with that motive. Um, but there's just nothing to support it. And, and, and the way it happened, it's just very unlikely that he would have the time frame is small. There were computer, 
computer, you know, uh, he was on the computer, he was on his telephone, and he would have to go by CCTV and a possible lot of people to take her down there and try to stuff her in with no help, trying to hold open the thing and get her squirming body in. And I just don't see any validity to it. Could have happened, but it's just nothing to support it. But there's a lot more to support that it was a suicide attempt, that she had become very, very depressed and went down there and thought to hell with it. And since other women have done it, she can do it too. And it was proven she does fit into the, into the shoot. So it was not impossible for her to do this to herself. So I stand with that. Um, again, you don't have to agree with me, but in the commentary, uh, I will limit comments below where people start attacking me and start saying, oh, you just don't know what you're talking about. You're ignoring the evidence. No, a lot, the evidence is clear and I just presented it to you. Um, if you don't want to believe the evidence, you can, or you think the evidence is clear, but there's still something else possible, bully for you. But I presented the evidence, and the evidence does not support in any way that he, the boyfriend, there's no proof that he killed her, and there's no evidence to support that. So, you know, uh, I'm going to stand by that. Now, let me go to your comments, because there are some of them out here. All righty then. All right. Okay, so, let me see. Uh... Let's see. Oh, <laughs> who just wrote that? <laughs> Wait a minute. I got to go back and find who made that joke. <laughs> Lenny, I was my own Amazon secret Santa for a whole year when I took Ambien. <laughs> that is a, that might be a good part of Ambien. It's like, oh, who bought this for me? Oh, I always wanted one of these. <laughs> Man, is it. My credit card is like through the roof. <laughs> oh, my God. That's funny. Okay. <laughs> Let's see. Martin says, "Don't mind me rewinding to the start and falling asleep." Well, you, you know, it's it's you're in UK. What the hell are you even doing listening to the show? You, you three o'clock, four o'clock in the morning guy. <laughs> oh my goodness. Oh, oh, Martin says, "Good night, <laughs> good night, Martin." I I I know you're always here when you can be, but you know, unless you have nothing better to do in the wee hours of the morning, no. <laughs> Let's see. Um. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I saw, K. Rob says, I saw that one with the blonde. I hope they paid her well to squeeze in that trash chute door. You know, um, they, they were supposedly were friends of the family that they thought were the same kind of size. And, and it did look difficult. I'm not saying it didn't look difficult, but, you know, the people, you know, people, I wish people just understood the weird things people do and what they're willing to do to their bodies, the contortions they can put themselves through when they are obsessed, when they are adamant about doing something and they're psychotic at the moment. I mean, you know, psychosis does a lot to your brain and makes you do really, really strange stuff. It's just the reason people hit walls and break their damn fists. You know, it's like, why did you hit the wall? Because it felt good at the time. Why do people cut themselves over and over again? Because they want to. They do weird things to themselves. Um, and so, yes, yeah, sometimes what looks like a suicide could, could be a homicide. I mean, that's true. Um, but sometimes a suicide is a suicide. Um, and it's just really bizarre. Um, I saw a part where a man put her feet in first, looked relatively easier than the girl climbing in. Yeah, he was helping her. And she was going, thank you. That's different than, what are you doing? That's that's the difference. You have to, you have to, the thing is up here. You got to pick the girl up. Try to, just imagine it. Okay, I'm picking the girl up somehow. And just not, you know, she's a small girl. Uh, I mean, she's not a heavy girl. She's a skinny thing. But still, she's got weight. You're trying to pick her up. You're trying to open the door with one hand. And then you're trying to shovel her feet in with the other hand. What? Really? I mean, no. The guy was helping her. Not He wasn't f trying to force a body in by himself. That's two different things. And you got to be careful about how things are enacted out. You know, when you have cooperation. So, um, so that's nonsense. Uh, so, so I say, this is, this is all stage. The second thing is, you're only seeing the video they want you to see. And they also want, they want you to see how hard it is. They're not trying to make it easy. So if, it, if, if the girl got in there really quick one time, they're like, oh yeah, let's do that one again. You're only seeing an edited version. Unless there's some proof, unless the police were standing there watching this, it's, it's edited to whatever they want it to look like. And again, 
They never showed a, one person holding a struggling girl and trying to shovel her in there. If they'd done that and proven it, I would have been impressed. They didn't. They didn't bother because they know that that would look really bad and impossible. It's called manipulation. All right. Uh, and no, <laughs> no, and no, it was just a communication issue. You know, the, one of the problems of conspiracy theories is is reaching out for the most, just anything, any crazy thing. I'm sorry, crazy thing, and trying to connect it. To, that's that's not evidence. That's not profiling. That's not how you do crime scene analysis. This is how the internet does analysis. This is how your grifter channels who have. 100,000 followers will tell you that's how it could be. Oh, maybe the CCTV guy. No, the police asked for it. They, the communication screwed up. And by the time they figured out what they wanted, it was written over. It happens all the time. I have experience with dealing with police investigations. And I've seen things, you know, life isn't perfect. Police investigations aren't perfect. you got lots of people involved. Somebody's told to do something and told to get this and that. And... Sometimes it just doesn't go as well as you wished. And then you're all pissed off because it failed. It happens. But no, nobody, there, now you now you not only not thinking the boyfriend did it, now you think some complete stranger somehow decided to kill her for no reason. They, people do have to have some kind of motive, you know. Nobody's going to kill her for nothing. All right. What? That girl with the ponytail was easily lifted up by the guy, threw her on his shoulder, dumped her semi-conscious. Some, some she wasn't fighting him. Semi, she wasn't fighting him. He was helping her. I can't. I don't know how many times I can say that. He was helping her, helping her. Not putting her arms out. Not going like this. Not going like this. Helping her. She wasn't doing anything. <sighs> okay. Pat, Benny says, Pat, I think the biggest problem with the theory that Aunt killed her was that he actually did not kill her as she was alive at the end of the shoot. Yes, she was alive. You know, if she'd been dead and he put her in there, I would have been okay with that maybe. I'm still having a problem with the CCTV and people in the hallway problem. You know, carrying dead people down hallways to trash shoots probably isn't a good idea with CCTV. Um, or the fact you're going to run into somebody, they're going to immediately say, I saw a guy carrying a woman down the hall. I have a problem with that especially at that time. I mean, I would think if I were him, I would be at least waiting till one o'clock in the damn morning. I make sure, like, I, I don't know, find some way to get around the camera too. If, I don't know about the camera and what was going on there, but still, I would not want to run into somebody in the hallway. So yes, if she were totally unconscious, <clears throat> yes, then he could carry her over there. She wouldn't be moving. He could maybe open the thing and get her legs in there. She's dead. She's dead. You can Then you can squash her around and do anything you want with her. But if she is not totally dead, and she wasn't when she hit the bottom, she had enough. She she was able to crawl around that room. She wasn't dead when she went in. She wasn't unconscious when she went in. She was conscious. So there's just no freaking way that that's a small. It is a small thing. Somebody's got to maneuver themselves in, and you cannot maneuver yourself a a move, moving person into that. It, it it makes no sense, and there's no evidence of it. So, um, yes, K, K. Rob is correct. The media leaves out stuff for dramatic effect and ratings. Right. They, they could have done a very good show saying, this is what the police have shown us. These are the whatever. And this is what the family is looking at. And now we're going to do both reenactments. We're going to look at all the evidence. But that's not the way they do things because that doesn't get ratings. They decided, the family, they, I don't know if the family came to 60 Minutes or 60 Minutes came to the family. You never know. But they go, hey, this is going to be a good show. People think she could have been murdered. Let's get the family here. Let's do reenactments. Let's, help, let's get this all from the family's point of view. Let's, let's make it, everybody think it could be murder. Because that's what people want. You know, that's what will get ratings. If they, they disagree with the police, they're not even going to have a show. <laughs> Let me tell you, I've worked enough with television to know that, you know, they're going to go, yeah, you know, we, we, we want we want viewers man we want viewers um uh, pat would you have a different conclusion if both of the women were not mentally ill when you talk about the totality of the cases that is a good question may um 
to both of these cases are so bizarre that generally speaking, people who are in good health are not suicidal, not psychotic, probably would not choose these methodologies. These things wouldn't have happened to them. Um, yeah. Yeah, I, I definitely think that's part of the totality of the case. I mean, it's like, would they be able to, would they consider doing this? And the answer is yes, because of their mental state. Um, if somebody's in totally healthy mental state, I'm not putting myself down a garbage chute tonight. <laughs> you know what I mean? I'm not doing it. I'm not going up on a roof of a building and getting into a, into a tank. Um, so yes, I mean, that has a lot to do with it. Now, having said that, as I pointed out, sometimes a person could be a complete psychological mess and get become a victim because of it. Um, also, it's like prostitutes. Prostitutes can be killed by serial killers. Prostitutes can be raped. Just because you're a prostitute doesn't mean that you can't become a victim. You can, because they're working in a dangerous profession anyway. Um, so yes, you can become a victim, uh, even though you have, you know, you're a high risk person to, you know, in your own behavior. Um, makes you a high risk for being a victim for somebody else. However, in these particular cases, in, 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 in the first case, Alyssa Lam, there's just no other evidence anybody else was around. And the psychotic problem happened right before the death. The same thing here with Phoebe. Right before the death, the very night, she'd just been saying she's suicidal, just sent her family that email. She just took all the alcohol and drugs right before she went down. So we're not talking about everything was going well for her. She was off of the medication. She was you know, taking her medications. She was, she was happy. Things were going well. She, she, no, there was no indications. She was home, not drinking, not doing anything dangerous, but she was. And the fact that she took the um, still, still knocks, um, Ambien, it was not nighttime. Why was she taking it in the middle of the day? You know, with along with a hell of a lot of alcohol. So this is not somebody, she could have waited for him to get home and they could have had a drink together. She was seriously depressed. She was suicidal in the middle of the day. She was home alone and she was amping up the, the, the self-medicating. And then she ends up in a trash chute. So yes, it, it, has an, it has a reason to be considered as part of the totality. So that's a very good question. Um, Florence says, someone said she was an avid climber. Any chance she decided to rappel down the chute for a lark? It doesn't seem like a sure death. What if you broke your back and got paralyzed? Okay, yeah, she did climb. So this was another reason why, actually, when they said it was so hard for her to get in, because she was into climbing, I mean, I can't, <laughs> I can't climb up a step. <laughs> you know, I couldn't have gotten in that damn tra trash chute no matter what you did. No, that wasn't going to happen. So, if you find me down a trash chute, somebody did put me in there because I don't know. I can't climb that good. I suck at that. So, um, but you're one of these people that goes up rappels, they go up walls and shit like that. You know, she could probably climb into that dang thing. Um, she had the ability and the strength in her body. Um, why did she go down it? Now, I have a theory, you know, there is a, it's a trash compactor at the end. That's what cut her, cut her foot off, you know, cut her foot off. She bled to death. Um, she was brutalized when she, oh, I didn't show you that. Okay. Let me, let me show you. Um, there was a nasty little thing she went down. Okay. This is it. At the top is where she goes down. And then you see where there's a, there's a whole thing that goes over to, no, that you have to go around that little corner and then you drop down. You go through some, you go through some little machinery that's not very nice, uh, which cuts you up. I don't know that she knew that was down there. Okay. Just, just to be, you know, I honestly didn't know that's what I, I didn't know that was at the bottom of a trash chute. Um, my grandma used to have a trash chute in Manhattan and there was nothing down there except like, you know, you threw your trash down and it fell into a big, big, huge pile of crap down at the bottom. Uh, as a matter of fact, I think if sometimes if you'd gone down that trash chute, you just sort of bounced when you got to the bottom, landing in all the trash. Um, not everything has a trash compactor at the bottom, and they only run certain hours. So maybe she didn't even know. Maybe in her own uh, way her brain was thinking at the time. Remember I talk about people like to get into dark places? Maybe she just thought it as, I'm going to go down this little hole. I'm just going to go down the hole into oblivion. Maybe she never even thought about it. You know, I don't know that she knew what was down there. So sad, but true. But you know, it's just, just the way things are sometimes. 
And I have no idea who took the dog. I have not a clue. I don't know what's happening with the dog. Um, so, you know, um, very, very tragic cases. Um, and I, I understand why the Phoebe case is much more uh, questionable than the Alyssa, Alyssa Lamb case. Um, I really wasn't so sure when I looked at this case what I was going to think at the end of it. Um, but once I read the, all the information in the inquest, once I saw the time frame, once I saw so many of the other issues uh, in, in this case, and the fact that he did not kill the other girl too, <laughs> you know, um, then I, I came to the conclusion that it, the, the evidence does support that she got in the trash chute on her own. Um, and, uh, you know, that's, that's, what, that's the way I see it. Um, that's where, if I were analyzing this case for the police department, I'd come up with the same exact thing. Um, and, uh, yeah, I just don't see the evidence points anywhere else, um, even if you don't like the dude, you know. So, <laughs> um, well, let, let me look at this one. In Port, uh, Mo Molly says, in Port Clinton, Ohio, in December 2019, a troubled 14-year-old boy climbed a two-story house to go down a 9-inch by 13-inch chimney to skip school. He died of asphyxiation. No drugs involved, just sheer will. You know, I don't know what it is about these little small places. You can't believe, well, there's just so many of them. I'm talking so many where people crawl into tiny little places and die. Usually uh, a positional asphyxiation is the number one reason they die. They don't realize when they're in there, they get stuck or they just keep going into, it gets smaller and smaller and smaller and suddenly they just, they can't get enough air, you know, there's not enough air circulating and there's too much pressure. Uh, they don't realize what they're getting into and they can't get back out. Uh, so a lot of people would found in chimneys, in walls, um, just all these bizarre places, and, you know, and the amount of so the trash chute deaths is, is, is phenomenal. I mean, I'd rather jump off a, a balcony, you know, it seems a little bit better, but I don't think that, I don't think that apartment had any balconies, did it? So, you know, if you don't have balconies, you can't jump off of them. Um, I don't know anything about that. I, I, I don't remember if there are lie detectors given. I don't know that he was ever a suspect because the police analyzed it and determined that that she put herself in the trash chute. And I know you don't want to believe it. You, I, I read what you said before. You absolutely believe both of these cases are murder cases. All I'm doing is presenting the evidence to you. Um, and this is what the channel is about. Again, it's an educational channel. I'm, I'm not here to argue with people. And, you know, I don't want to start a big thing where, you know, hundreds of people come in and say, oh, you know, this is, here's another theory. Here's another theory. Here's another theory. No, this is the evidence. The evidence does not support homicide. It doesn't in either case. Um, and I say, you may not believe it, may not agree with it, but I'm not going to argue it on and on and on. Uh, I respect that you have your own opinion on it. Um, but I do hope you understand what I'm trying to explain to you as a criminal profiler and somebody's worked a lot of homicide cases. This is what the evidence supports, but I will link below, uh, the, thank you. Thank you. And I appreciate that. I mean, I know it's, it's tough when you, you know, and you just feel like, Oh, this can't be true. But I've worked a lot of these cases and, you know, um, I, I had another case. Um, I was going to, I was going to use it for this show, but I decided not to, um, but it was an, another case was very similar to this, and the family came, brought me in because they thought it was a murder case. And it, and it turned out to be an accidental death case where, like, the guy was, like, smoking weed, like, in his window and fell out. I mean, and the evidence was there. The evidence, the way he fell, um, the, the family believed that his body was put at the bottom. He fell out a w window and, like, um, there were, like, uh, it was, like, one of these, um, you know, between the buildings, they have these, like, just these spaces between the buildings that had all these air conditioners and that poor guy he like hit every air conditioner on the way down it was very unpleasant and but the family believed his body was he was killed in the apartment and then carried down and put there but the police said look it's that's not what it shows they thought it might be suicide i truly believe that he fell out the window when he because there was evidence that he was like goofing around and sm smoking something and he was sitting uh, perching perching up, I think he just lost his balance and then fell down. And there was evidence he was alive as he was hitting everything on the way down. And, um, you know, it's, it's one of these things where as a family, you just don't want to go there. You, you don't want to believe your kid did that to himself. And I'm sure, I'm sure Phoebe's family doesn't want to believe Phoebe would do that to herself, but she, 
but she had 10 years, over 10 years of psychiatric problems. This is not a new thing. It was something like everything was just going great for Phoebe. Her life was perfect. She was, everything was wonderful. No, she had 10 years of psychiatric problems. Um, and the family's in denial. Clearly her mother's been always in denial. It's not, it's not about what's happening. You know, it's, it's everybody else's fault, but Phoebe's, she, she can't, she can't handle the fact that Phoebe has always had problems. And I don't know what happened in that family so that that child was a mess by the time she was 14. Maybe it's just her own personality, but maybe there are family problems too. And they ended up, there was a contentious divorce. Apparently Phoebe didn't deal well with that either. So, you know, I don't know what went on there, but, um, you know, Phoebe had problems. So did Elisa. Um, they had problems for many, 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 many years. And they were on many, many, many drugs. And they went to therapists. So they had lots of issues. And unfortunately, sadly, those issues finally got them. Um, uh, May says, oh, Pat, could you do the Japanese toilet mystery? What? <laughs> Wait a minute. Okay, this is interesting. In 1989, where a man died under the traditional style toilet. Okay, wait a minute. I have to check this out because I, <laughs> that is interesting. I I don't know what a Japan a traditional style Japanese toilet is. I, I know it many. I've been in many countries, so I've you know I've enjoyed many kinds of um, bathroom facilities. Uh, holes in the ground, little foot things, you know, wooden shacks, you know, all kinds of stuff. I do not know what a Japanese traditional toilet is. I'll have to look that one up. I might do that one. That sounds interesting. <laughs> Well, that's the name of it. <laughs> that's a great name. The Urinal Mystery of Japan, 1989. I'm, I'm definitely looking into that one, May. <laughs> that's a bizarre one. <laughs> that's just really interesting. Oh, my goodness. Uh, thank you for that one. I mean, there's there's just amazing amount of um, strange crimes. You know, you never, you'd never think that people could get themselves into so many odd situations and odd places or sometimes in homicides also very strange things happen in homicides people do the most horrific things to other human beings and you just say why would why would they do that so why would they do that to themselves why would they do that to other people you know it's it's hard, it's hard to understand you know we're given life on this planet and you think we just use you do we'd use it to the most in the most beautiful way possible but it doesn't always work out that way for people and it's a shame. So I, you know, I just want to say I'm really amazed I got through this broadcast without the internet croaking on me. So, ha, ah, yes, <laughs> that's I'm thrilled. <laughs> so anyway, um, thank you for being here. To, this was this was a lot. Of, this was a fascinating couple of cases to do, um, and I really enjoyed them. And what I'm going to do uh, this Sunday coming up um, is I'm going to do Cape Cod crimes. There were two Cape Cod crimes. Um, two women who were murdered in Cape Cod. They were both solved cases, but there's, they're very interested in the way the cases were handled and the people that ended, ended up getting convicted. There's some questions about the convictions. And I worked one of these cases uh, up in Cape Cod. I spent time up there. I was involved in polygraphing and interviewing and, uh, and I'm still confused over the results of that case. Uh, so it's going to be really interesting. This will be next, this will be Sunday coming up at 3 p.m. Eastern time. It is daylight savings time, so I believe that means for the guys in the UK, you'll finally come a little earlier. I think it's 7 p.m. Let me see. Yeah, 7 7 p.m. It's going to be 7 p.m. in the UK and um, where else? And elsewhere in the world, we have that hour difference, which we stupidly do in the U.S. So. I'm not sure what time it will be for everybody else. So anyway, um, it was great having you here uh, again. Um, if you want to participate in the live, please go below and click on Patreon um, and you'll find out how to join the lives. Uh, I, but my videos um, are all public. Every, every video I do is public. Um, so the live part is for Patreon, patrons only of Patreon. Reason is it keeps out all the bots and all the haters and all the, the stuff that makes everything a mess. And I have wonderful chat room now with wonderful people in it. But, you know, so if you want to join in the actual chat room, please do come and join Patreon. It also supports the channel. And then if you can't do that, you'll still get to see the video for free like everything else on my channel. So uh, thank you for being here. Um, and it's been very fascinating cases here today. So see you next time. <laughs>